Look, I'm not one to rain all over a great storyline. Very few people in my line of work on this side of the fence are. However, I really, really, really want to tamp down these expectations for Louis Domingue and underscore how much of a challenge he and his teammates have in front of them. Good morning to you. Good Monday morning. I'm Dayan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Penguins. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or baseball. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Pirates that I hope you'll take the time to check out. It is Game 4 tonight at PPG Paints Arena, 7.10 p.m. face-off, and it will be Louis versus... Oh, okay, it's going to be Igor Shesterkin. It sure is fun, though, to think that Gerard Gallant would be facing a decision. Am I right? Like, that he's going, yeah, but I brought in Alexander Georgiev, and you know he only gave up one goal, and he was really sharp, and my other guy let me down. He's not doing that. He's not doing that. Uh, the only time we'll have seen something dumber than that was, and I'm going to really date myself with this reference, was whenever... Old Viktor Tikhonov thought it was a great idea to sit Vladislav Tretiak for the final portion of the Miracle on Ice. A part of that story that doesn't get told nearly often enough. Look, the Louis story is great. It really is. He's almost 30 years old. It's the first big, big chance he's had to excel on a stage like this. Actually, to perform on a stage like this at all. And it's easy to see and hear that he's having a terrific time with it. I try to shut everything down, you know, try to play this as it's just another game and it's just another day. At, at the end of the day, we're playing hockey. Um, you know, from the moment I, I brought my net outside in, my, in the street and, and put my rollerblades on and played outside and have, you know, cars go around my net this is what I was, this is the film I was playing in my head the whole time, you know? So, um, even if it's new to me, it, it, it this, like I said, this is a film that I've been playing in my head for a long time. So I'm trying to control my emotions. It's pretty hard, uh, to be honest. It's, it's, uh, it, it's so new and it's, it's a lot, it's a lot, but we're going to take it a day at a time and, and move on. Like we're going to enjoy tonight. And then tomorrow it's mother's day. Happy mother's day, all the mothers, but, uh, we're going to, just move on and move on to the next game. Not going to lie. That line about moving the net off the street when cars are coming, that hits like right right in the core of those of us who love and have participated in this sport at any level. And it's been beautiful to see and hear the way Pittsburghers have instantly, like, out of nowhere, adopted him. I, I guarantee you that the overwhelming majority of even casual hockey fans in Pittsburgh weren't aware that Louis existed until double overtime of game one. But there they were chanting his name, and there was the Nakama uh, Japanese Steakhouse that has a location inside PPG Paints Arena offering the spicy pork and broccoli. And it's a ton of fun. It really is. It reminds a lot of us of Johann Hedberg's arrival in 2001 and the way the city wore the moose antlers and everything because he played for the Manitoba Moose, which was Winnipeg's AHL team at the time. And everyone's chanting, Moose, and now it's Louis. And it's one of the countless things that makes the Stanley Cup playoffs so great. You do have unexpected heroes in virtually any series. But, but, and here comes the downer part. Louis got a 903 save percentage and a 4.03 goals against average. That's not going to cut it. Both of those figures need to improve significantly for the Penguins to win this series, even if you're just standing way, 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 way back and examining the situation from afar, if you looked just at those two numbers 
I can promise you that any outcome in which Pittsburgh takes this round and advances, Louis going to have to make both of those numbers better. And I, I don't know that he can, but I also don't know that he can't. This portion of Daily Shot of Penguins is brought to you by the good people at the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank, where they're committed to providing food for all of our neighbors in need across western Pennsylvania. They, in turn, need your help. Find out how $1 can be turned into five full meals for those in need. Visit pittsburghfoodbank.org. Let me throw something at you. What did you think was Louie's best save? the other night in Game 3. If you're like me, you're thinking of the stop, the diving, lunging, falling forward stop on Artemi Panarin on the New York power play early in the third period. It was wonderful. Gerard Gallant, over on the New York side after the game, praised it without being solicited, without it being brought up. He mentioned that save and Louis' body of work on those New York power plays. But (laughs) if it sounds like I've got a butt coming for every good thing that I say here, it's because I do. That methodology that Louis used to get over there, which looked a lot, I should add, like Marc-Andre Fleury's famous save on Nicholas Lidstrom to complete the 2009 championship, that's not something that's going to work for him. The next time he tries it, he's going to need to find a way to move with all of the east-westing that the Rangers do on a regular basis, but especially on what's usually a very, very dangerous power play. To date, I've seen two things from Louis in this category. One is that thing that he did to Panarin. Because he also did it to Mika Zibanejad in the game before that. And it's just this desperate heave of his whole self. He even used the term in describing that save as wholesale. And that's what he meant. He just took all of Louis Domingue and sent it over to the right side. The other tendency I've noticed, and this one honestly concerns me more, is that when he goes left to right, he'll go too far. He'll slide all the way out of the picture. That's something that Casey DeSmith does as well whenever he's not on top of his game, when he's not being economical, he's not staying between the pipes. Tristan Jari is excellent at both of these things I just described. Completely contained, in control, mechanical, stays tall. But neither you nor anyone else wants to hear that right now because Jari's not playing tonight, and he might not play in this series. So what I think has to happen here between now and, oh, you know, 7.09 p.m. today is that Louis and Andy Kyoto, the goaltending coach, need to figure out a way to work some form of greater steadiness into Louis's game when it comes to his East-West, if it's feasible, if it doesn't throw off everything else that he's done his whole life too much. That's what I mean when I say I don't know if he can't do this or if he can. I asked Louis after Game 3 about this subject specifically, about the way the Rangers move laterally the way they do and how that compared to what he's seen in the AHL. Oh, it's, it's a big step from the AHL, that's for sure. There's, there's no comparison there, but um, it's uh, they're, they're a good offensive team. They're a great team. They're, uh, they're tough to beat. You know, I, there's no easy, there's not going to be a, one easy game. You know, if we thought that it was going to be easy after the first period, you know, they certainly prove us wrong there because it's, they're a good team and they're going to be tough to beat. So, uh, we're up 2-1 right now. That's We're, we're going to go to bed being up 2-1, but tomorrow we're waking up, and it's a it's, it's a one-game series. we got to win the next one. Okay, he went kind of off tangent toward the end of that, but if you paid attention to the beginning portion of that response, I mean, he's laughing. He's going, this isn't the AHL. 
He's never had to face movement like that. He's never had to go from one side to the other like that. At least he hasn't for a very, very long time, going back to his previous stints as an NHL backup. This, to me, is the challenge. This is the big thing going into this game and maybe into Game 5 and beyond in this series. Watch for it right away. Watch for it in the first 5-10 minutes when you see the Rangers make one of those patented passes and try one of those one-timers. They've got a bunch of guys who can do either. If you see Louie looking smooth and just kind of getting across a little bit, enough to make the save and he stays in control, well, now we're having a very, very different chapter added to this already inspirational story. When we come back, just one question. Today's J1Q comes from Scott, who asks, Gerard Gallant keeps throwing his first line out there, either double-shifting them or only giving them a short break. The Penguins have been trying to rotate their lines, eventually overplaying those main guys, even though they're younger, is going to take its toll. Maybe it already has. Hey, I'm going to interject with something here, Scott, and forgive me for this, but I keep hearing all these references to the Rangers being younger. They have younger guys, and they have one line that's got two exceptional young talents in Capo Caco and Alexi Lafreniere. And I would throw Adam Fox, the defenseman, obviously, into that same group if you want to include the back line. But this idea, and it comes up a lot, that Chris Kreider, Mika Zibanejad, and Frank Vetrano are like these new dudes or something. No, (laughs) they've been around for a while. They're very fast. And in Vetrano's case, he's a lockdown certainty to score in every single game that he plays against Pittsburgh. But uh, younger, no. Anyway, to answer your actual question, Gallant and his usage of the lines hasn't struck me as any significant factor, although I'll admit that whether I'm covering the Penguins or the Steelers or the Pirates in a given game, I'm a lot like you in that I'm paying way more attention to what they do than what the other guys do or what the other coaches do. I am going to be a lot more likely to pick up when individual performances are either above or below the expected lines. And I will say that out of the three guys that I just mentioned, the one that's really kind of left me scratching my head is Zabanajad because I'm so used to him being such a dynamic force. And he's still visible. It, it's hard not to notice him and not just because of all that hair and everything else. He's got the the wide stride, really animated, just has an overall, like, explosive look to him. But I can say that and also say that I haven't seen him really accomplish a whole lot. He's missing the net a ton. His passing has been there at times. It hasn't at others. And Kreider, while understanding that he's a very different type of player, uh, he's now finally a 50-goal scorer in the league, and I say that with admiration. But he's way more the type who's going to pounce on power play opportunities. He's going to be around the net. He's going to redirect. He's going to get rebounds. He's even going to be effective from behind the goal. The Rangers haven't shown much with their power play, largely because they haven't had too many, because the Penguins have stayed disciplined for the most part. So I know this. When I was in New York, most of the attention, uh, most of the negative attention that was attached to the Rangers, whether it was through the media or through social media or whatever, had to do with the power play. That power play was an enormous part of the success the Rangers had in the regular season, clicking at more than 30%. And it just hasn't been a factor, really, in this series. And that probably applies double 
in Game 3 because the Rangers had those three consecutive power plays, including those two early in the third period, and a lot of their faithful and a lot of the people who cover them feel very strongly that that's where the game should have been won and that it never should have come down to the Danton Heinen goal that came at the 858 mark. So if Gallant is overusing Kreider, Zabanajad, and Vetrano, he's not overusing them on the power play, and I think that's the more prominent issue here. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everyone listening to Daily Shot of Penguins, and we're going to have another one tomorrow to talk about Game 4.